proceed. We are about to start the session. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now begin the clustered interactive dialogue with a special rapporteur on the right of food. in this context. Delegations wishing to inscribe on the list of speakers should do so by using the electronic system which will be open shortly. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Mr. Olivier de Schutter, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, and Mrs. Rachel Rolnik, Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. Before I give the floor to the mandate holders, I would like to ask the Secretariat to activate the electronic system for inscription on the list of speakers. Yes, yes, of course. When I say this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The provisional list will be shown on the screen shortly. The list of speakers will close exactly in 15 minutes. I now invite Mr. Olivier de Schutter to present his report. You have 14 minutes for the presentation, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to take the floor before the Human Rights Council for the last time in my present capacity as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. You have before you three reports. Two reports summarize the findings from my missions in Malawi and Malaysia, where I conducted official visits in 2013. And in addition, I shall have the honor of presenting a thematic report, the eighth report I'm presenting to the Human Rights Council since my appointment in 2008. Um, and in this final report, I tried to draw some conclusions from my six years as hold of the mandate of Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Allow me to begin with a few words about the two country reports. I visited Malawi in July 2013. Malawi is, of course, one of the poorest countries in the world. Levels of malnutrition are alarmingly high. About half of all children under the age of five show signs of chronic malnutrition. Moreover, its demographic growth at 2.6% per year is one of the strongest in the world. As a result, the pressure on Malawi's natural resources is extreme. Malawi is well known for its uh, farm input subsidy program, FISP, initiated during the 2005-2006 growing season. This program relies on the distribution of seeds and fertilizers for a cost that represents about half the budget of the Ministry of Agriculture and between 8 and 16 percent of the total public budget of the state, depending on the costs of inputs on every um, single year. Though the program has had significant positive impacts on the realization of the right to food for small farmers, I conclude that this program is in urgent need of reform. The program's targeting is far from perfect. Its fiscal sustainability is in doubt due to the rising costs of fertilizer imports and the impact on the balance of payments of the country. And the program 
does not encourage the sustainable use of resources for food production. In fact, inorganic fertilizers in many ways may be masking soil nutrient depletion rather than correcting it. In my report, I therefore emphasize the need for much greater diversification of agriculture and for a brown revolution improving soil fertility and a blue revolution improving water conservation in addition to the green revolution component um, of the farm input subsidy program. The report addresses, of course, a wide range of other issues that have an impact on the enjoyment of the right to food in Malawi. I cannot discuss these issues here, but I strongly believe that a, a framework law on the right to food would be extremely beneficial to the country. It would strengthen accountability and institutional oversight over food and nutrition security programs, including on the way information is collected um, and uh, the way the programs are assessed, thus increasing transparency and safeguards against the use of political criteria in the targeting of programs. I trust that the government of Malawi will continue its constructive dialogue on these issues with my successor, and I would like to thank them for their constructive engagement with the Human Rights Council special procedures. In Malaysia, impressive progress was made in recent decades in reducing poverty, and the government has set as its target to transform Malaysia into an advanced, high-income country by 2020. It is now working on the uh, formulation of the 11th Malaysia Plan, 2011-2016, as well as on a National Human Rights Action Plan to further move the country towards this target. My mission, therefore, took place under particularly favorable circumstances and um, uh, was particularly useful as these programs are now being designed. My report highlights three priorities for Malaysia. First, while Malaysia has recently adopted a minimum wage legislation and has made progress towards providing safety nets to the population, many of these social protection schemes in Malaysia are instituted on an ad hoc basis with a generally limited reach, and the schemes fail to guarantee legal entitlements to support. I therefore welcome plans to develop a comprehensive social safety net, integrating and coordinating the various plans to develop a comprehensive social safety net in, um, into one coherent policy and introducing a rights-based approach to social protection. Secondly, as highlighted in uh, the report of the um, uh, Human Rights Commission of Malaysia on land rights of indigenous peoples, uh, access to land and resources of indigenous peoples and their rights to give their free prior and informed consent for any change in their lands and territories, this right should be strengthened further. Third, Malaysia hosts some 4 million foreign workers, about half of which are undocumented. These workers are heavily represented, in particular, on palm oil plantations. Serious concerns have been expressed about the legal situation and working conditions of these migrant workers, who often work under unfavorable um, employment terms, such as low wages and informal or unwritten contracts of employment. This has a serious impact on the right of these workers to an adequate standard of living, including access to adequate food. I am confident that the government of Malaysia shall seek to remedy these gaps, and I would like to thank them for the very constructive spirit in which the visit was conducted. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today I have the honor of presenting my final thematic report to the Human Rights Council. I was appointed in March 2008 at the height of the global food price crisis. My first initiative was to call for the Council to convene a special session to address the human rights dimension of this crisis. The special session took place on 22nd of May 2008, the first time ever that the Human Rights Council addressed in a special session the emergency um, that resulted from this massive threat to a social right, the right to food, resulting from irrational markets driven by speculation and largely manufactured fears about levels of stock. By convening that special session and by adopting then a resolution asking me to provide you with an assessment of the global food price crisis based on the human right to adequate food, 
you sent a strong signal to the world. Your message was that hunger and malnutrition could be tackled, but that doing so required political will and a greater focus on the most marginalized groups of the population whose income poverty and political disempowerment are mutually reinforcing. Indeed, a few months ago, at my last appearance before the Third Committee of the General Assembly, during the 68th session of the General Assembly, I again emphasized the important role that the right to food could play in shaping the responses of states to the scandal of hunger and malnourishment. I insisted in my oral statement on hunger and malnutrition not being natural calamities due to poor soils or unfavorable skies, but these are man-made curses, the result of depriving food producers from access to resources, of failing to protect workers' rights to living wages, or the failure to make progress on social protection and on gender empowerment. Therefore, the roles of accountability and participation, of non-discrimination and empowerment of the poor are essential. Hunger ultimately is a political question, not a technical question alone. Of course, you are familiar with my contributions and there is no need for me to detail them here. At the request of the Human Rights Council, I prepared two special reports on the global food price crisis. I also presented six interim reports to the General Assembly, including an initial report outlining my program of work and five interim reports to the Human Rights Council. A significant portion of my work went to examining how small-scale food producers could be supported. But I did not, of course, limit myself to the question of how to support this particularly vulnerable and fragile group. I also examined, for example, the contribution of women's rights to the right to food. I emphasized the importance of nutrition and an improved connection between agricultural policies and health concerns. I discussed the importance of speculation on the financial derivatives of agricultural commodities, as well as the problems associated with concentration in the food chains. In a series of briefing notes and in my latest report to the General Assembly, I documented a range of initiatives that have been taken in recent years to implement the right to adequate food in legal, institutional and policy frameworks in all regions. The progress was most impressive in Latin America. Africa is now following suit to various initiatives linked in particular to the ECOWAS, the um, Economic Community of West African States and the Community of Portuguese-speaking Portuguese States. Those reports I presented were deliberately focused in nature. They offered an in-depth examination of certain specific themes because I believe that even the largest problems, such as hunger and malnutrition, become manageable if we break them down in smaller pieces. In the final report I'm presenting today, I draw conclusions of a more general nature based on a more holistic analysis of the causes of hunger and malnutrition and on the potential of an approach based on the right to food to tackle these causes. Three key messages emerge from my work. The first message is that the paradigm through which hunger and malnutrition have been addressed until six years ago has been changed dramatically. In the past, it was believed that the solution to these problems was in increasing production combined with trade and aid to channel food from food surplus regions to food deficit regions. This paradigm, unfortunately, was a disincentive to supporting farmers who were not sufficiently equipped to survive in the emerging global competition and resulted in an addiction of whole regions to cheap foodstuffs imported from abroad. I documented these problems in the report that followed my mission to the World Trade Organization in 2008 and in the more recent document calling for, sec for food security objectives to be better taken into account in trade discussions. This old paradigm we have now learned is not sustainable. The consensus today has changed. The consensus today is that we must support the ability of each region to feed itself and to reinvest in local production. The deconcentration of food production is the best adaptation strategy against climate change and it is also the best means 
to reduce rural poverty in the developing world. The problem, however, is that not all sectoral policies are aligned with this new post-food crisis paradigm. In particular, many trade negotiators still tend to measure success by increase of trade volumes rather than by improvements in rural development and the reduction of rural poverty. Against this background, better aligning trade policies on, new food, on the new food security agenda should be treated as an urgent priority. A second message follows. Under the past 20th century paradigm, most efforts went to supporting export-led agriculture, large-scale, linked to global supply chains and large markets, and competitive. Farmers were encouraged to produce commodities for the food processing industry rather than food for their communities. Small-scale farmers were disadvantaged twice. They were not well equipped to satisfy the exigencies of global supply chains and large commodity buyers, and they were the first victims of the dumping occurring on their own domestic markets. The result is that local agri-food systems were underdeveloped, and so were local and regional markets. This imbalance must be remedied. It is high time to improve access of small-scale farmers to local markets and to develop local and regional markets. A third message, finally, concerns the means through which the transition towards more balanced food systems can be achieved, recognizing the important function of local agri-food systems and improving connections of small-scale farmers to markets. It is here that the right to food has a crucial role to play. For change to be achieved, we need local communities to be given political space. We need ordinary citizens to enter into discussions with local producers, agri-food corporations, retailers, and public authorities to identify the range of measures that could be taken to improve the resilience of the food systems they depend on and to move towards systems that are more equitable, more environmentally sustainable, and make a better contribution to local development. This is what food policy councils in a rapidly growing movement across the world are trying to achieve. So I conclude on the need for, for more food democracy, and my final report um, emphasizes the need to improve participation and accountability to remove the existing lock-ins. This, to me, is the important message from the broad social movements rallying behind the idea of food sovereignty. Food sovereignty has never been about autarcy, which is neither desirable nor achievable, and it is not opposed to trade. But it does ask, and it asks rightly, who decides in food systems, for the benefit of whom, and on the basis of which considerations. It is a call for food systems that are designed in a more open, transparent, and inclusive way. The objectives of food sovereignty are therefore closely aligned with the requirements of the right to food. In closing, I would like to, to express my deep appreciation to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which provided excellent support to the mandate throughout these six years. I would also like to thank the many non-governmental organizations that have increasingly been referring to the right to food in their work for providing me with highly valuable information. And of course, I would like to, to thank the governments and you, the delegates to the Human Rights Council, for the high quality of the cooperation that we have developed throughout the mandate. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you for your presentation, and I now invite Mrs. Raka Rolnik to present a report. You have also 14 minutes. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, very honored to address the Human Rights Council in my capacity as Special Rapporteur to present my final thematic report with practical guidance for states and other stakeholders on security of tenure for the urban poor. I also present my report on the official visits carried in 2013 to Indonesia and to the United Kingdom. A year ago, in this room, I underscored the importance of security of tenure. I called it the cornerstone of the right to adequate housing and noted that its absence is one of the most acute vulnerabilities faced by the urban poor around the world. Often I said, 
Tenure insecurity leads to a range of human rights violations, affecting not only the right to adequate housing, but several other related rights. My work of the past year has reinforced my conviction. Globally, tenure insecurity is responsible for many millions of people living under a daily threat of eviction, lack of access to services, or in an ambiguous situation where their tenure status becomes the basis for discrimination or is used in their detriment by public and private actors. The crisis manifests itself in many forms and contexts and disproportionately impacts on the urban poor. Forced evictions may be its most visible sign. However, displacement resulting from development, gentrification, mega events, natural disasters, among others, is persistence and on the rise. I receive communications on such situations every day affecting hundreds of people. No one is fully protected from tenure insecurity. As the recent mortgage and financial crisis showed, even those families that trusted freehold as a safer option were impacted by foreclosures and as a result are now facing homelessness. It is evident that the poorest bear the brunt of tenure insecurity. This is often the case in self-made, unplanned and subservice urban settlements, including for tenants within the settlement, but it is equally the case for unprotected tenants elsewhere and for people facing foreclosures with no affordable housing alternatives in their horizon. Among them, some marginalized groups such as refugees, internally displaced persons, migrants, minorities, and women. Hence, in my view, any legislation, policy, and practice on security of tenure must acknowledge that individuals and communities occupying land and property to fulfill the right to adequate housing and who have no other adequate option on where to go have legitimate tenure rights that should be secured and protected. The concept of legitimate tenure rights extends beyond mainstream notions of private ownership and includes multiple tenure forms deriving from a variety of tenure systems. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, the good news is that a lot has been done around the world to increase security of tenure for the urban poor. There are concrete policies and practices addressing security of tenure and they offer an array of examples and lessons to enhance housing and urban development policy in the years to come. During the last two years, I have analyzed many of those practices from various countries, working closely with more than 100 housing public policy and human rights experts. I have developed a set of 10 short guiding principles which aims at distilling the essential context of legislation, policies and practices to be applied in different contexts and situations in line with my mandate as outlined in the Council's Resolution 15-8. The guiding principles on security of tenure for the urban poor are not an academic exercise divorced from the constraints of public policy design and implementation or the specificities of diverse societies and housing systems, nor they are intended as a recipe to be followed everywhere from 1 to 10. Rather, the guiding principles are meant as a toolbox to be applied according to a specific country context. Some principles may be more effective or necessary in one situation, while others may be central in another. Mr. President, the rapid pace of urbanization around the world is unquestionable. Already in 2000, 2007, more than half of the world population lived in cities, and a figure that is expected to rise to 60% by 2013 and 15 years from now. The plight of the urban poor is pressing, not the least because millions of people are moving into urban and peri-urban settlements as we speak, and frequently this settlement for short of the human rights standards of adequate housing. Many other urban poor living in unaffordable, substandard housing or are treated by evictions from their lifelong homes because of urban renewal plans or because they cannot afford to compete with international real estate investors. Let me briefly outline the 10 guiding principles for your consideration and you have uh, in the room this 
leaflet with these principles also printed in this way. The first principle is the foundation of all of them, strengthening diverse tenure forms. A variety of tenure forms should be promoted, strengthened and protected, including those deriving from statutory, customary, religious and hybrid tenure systems. So all relevant laws, policy and programs should be developed on the basis of human rights impact assessments, which identify and prioritize the tenure arrangement of the most marginalized. Principles two and three has to do with existing realities and the policies that could be implemented in order to recognize and acknowledge the existing realities, including facilitating participatory settlement mapping, enumeration, standard registration, and allocating funds to ministry and local governments for the implementation. Principle three, prioritizing in situ solutions unless they are exception, exceptional circumstances that justify evictions. But also it's very important, and this is principle four, that we must anticipate future realities and prevent further deterioration of housing conditions. On this regard, the social function of property is an essential element in order for the state to provide adequate access to land for all, including public land, but also private land. The following two principles, five and six, shed light on a core principle of human rights, discrimination uh, in the basis of tenure in law and practice that occurs all too often. It happens when a person tries to access basic services like water or electricity and cannot be uh, attended because is living in an ambiguous tenure situation. The principle six on the situation of women is very important because security of tenure should be protected regardless of age, marital, civil or social status and independent of the relationship with male households or community uh, members. Tenure security for the urban poor is affected by activities of diverse range of actors, not only states. So in principles 7 and 8, we refer to the responsibilities of business community as well as the responsibility of development cooperation. Principle 9, empowering the urban poor and holding states accountable, puts the urban poor at the center of the approach as the essential actors rather than mere recipients in strengthening security of tenure uh, efforts. And access to information, participation, transparency, all of that is essential in order to improve their security. Last but not least, Principle 10 stresses that there is no real protection without ensuring that the poor can access justice, so access to justice and remedies is the Principle uh, 10. Let me now go um, to, by closing that, I would like to note that the promotion of equality and non-discrimination in access to housing continues to require swift and well-defined action from government at all levels. Let me now go to uh, the report on the missions undertaken to Indonesia and um, to United Kingdom both at the invitation of the respective government, Indonesia in June 2013, UK in September 2013. <clears throat> Indonesia is the world's third most populous country with the fattest rate of growth in urban population in Asia and has enjoyed steady economic growth and poverty decline in the last 10 years. Still about more than 28 million people live below the poverty line. In this context, the coming years offer a window of opportunity to proactively ensure that rapid urbanization goes hand to hand with inclusive growth and poverty reduction. Legislation, policies and programs should encourage efficient urban spatial structure for all, sustainable planning of land use, investments in critical infrastructure, strengthening tenure security and provision of basic 
services and I recommend the government of Indonesia to bring its national and municipal legislation and regulations regarding forced evictions, land acquisition and land concessions in line with international human law and standards. In terms of land management and administration, I recommend enhanced protection for low-income households, indigenous communities and communities occupying land based on customary added law. For this purpose, urban special plans and land use regulations should ensure inclusionary development recognizing the kampung for what it has been an essential part of Indonesian urban fabric. And finally, I want to commend the strategy which is used by the Indonesian government on reconstruction, which is very complex in nature and um, Indonesia has a very important record on doing that according to uh, the human rights. In closing, um, I also want to present the mission to uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the official visit, recognizing the complexity of the central and devolved administration in relation to housing, because various housing and planning functions are devolved, while there are so central legislative powers such as those related to welfare and budgetary <laughs> decisions. The report, the full report, noted these differences and specificities. And I commend the United Kingdom for its history of ensuring that low and middle income households have access to adequate housing and have been protected from insecurity and reforms or poor housing standards. And this was possible because of a combination of housing, land and planning policies that were designed to pro provide adequate housing and to address backlogs or poor quality of existing housing stock plus a welfare system that including housing benefits. In line with by the international human rights standards, the United Kingdom is required to examine its legislation and policies over time, including in times of austerity, and to take every step to ensure that available resources are distributed fairly, consistently, and in a manner that protects the most vulnerable. And in my report, I regret that some policies and practices which had previously contributed to the progressive realization of the right to adequate housing are being eroded in recent years. In my view, it's essential to, to assess and evaluate the impact of the welfare reform has had on the right to adequate housing of, uh, of the vulnerable individuals and groups. And in light of the existing data and evidence, whether particular measures are having disproportionate impact on a specific group, assess if the cost of implementation of some reforms might outweigh the savings intended, thereby violating the state's obligation, the use of maximum uh, available resources. In this context, I recommend the suspension of the removal of the spare room subsidy and a careful evaluation of its negative impact on the right to adequate housing and general well-being of many vulnerable individuals and households. I also recognize the effort the government has made to devote resources uh, to address the gap between the housing needs and the supply of new houses, but I'm very concerned if this priority is placed on the most marginalized. And I suggest expanding grants and subsidies to local councils and housing associations. Because of the sake of time, I just uh, want to conclude my remarks, since this is my last intervention before the Human Rights Council. Uh, I wish to thank you for the privilege you granted me with my appointment as special, as special rapporteur and I'm grateful for welcoming me in your countries for official or working visit, for the many opportunities to interact whether during sessions, side events, bilateral meetings and for your contributions to my questionnaire. And I want to express my gratitude in particular to Germany and Finland who have co-sponsored this mandate and support my work throughout the years and to the Office of High Commission of Human Rights. I came to this job with years of practice in planning and housing policies and in academia. But as rapporteur, I have been confronted every day during the past six years with the views of the vulnerable, with the voices of the voiceless. I have also been faced with the immense challenge of finding channels of communication between them
them and decision makers, the government, in order to ensure that their voices were heard and taken into account. Modestly, I have tried to build those bridges by echoing the voices of those whose housing rights were on the treat, while trying to come up with recommendations for feasible and realistic policy response. And I'm most thankful to all individuals and communities, to all civil society organizations and housing experts and officials that have supported this work. Thank you very much. Very well. Thank you very much. And uh, um, we will reconvene after a technical break of five minutes to continue our interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on the right of food and the Special Rapporteur on the right of adequate housing. I hereby close the 17th meeting of the 25th session.